share the screen. Is the presentation visible to all of you? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so we'll start with the Shanti Mantra and then we'll begin the class. Om Purnamadaha, Purnamidam, Purnat Purnamadachete, Purnatsya, Purnamadaya, Purnameva Avashishate. Om Shanti. 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 Okay, welcome to the course CCN 534, uh, Antenna Theory and Design. So in the previous uh, class, we covered loop antennas and we all, we saw why we study loop antennas because uh, one of the important applications of loop antennas is in RFID applications. Probably it is one of the, it is the only application prevalent today, which is widely used today. So next time if you come across any of the RFID tags, try to see what the type of antenna being used in the RFID tags. And uh, we looked into small circular loop antennas. So when we say small, we mean, we mean that the radius of the loop is extremely small compared to the distance, compared to the observation point. So in such antennas, we, so we know how to analyze the loop antennas so, or any antenna in general, in wire antenna in general. So the way we do is, so we, we want to evaluate the auxiliary vector potential. So to evaluate the auxiliary vector potential, we need the current distribution and the space factor. So first we saw what is the space factor, capital R. Capital R is the distance from the observation point to the point on the antenna. So it keeps varying as we move along the antenna. And it's and when we integrate it along the length of the antenna, the space factor is going to vary. So we try to simplify uh, the space factor by having an expression for the space factor in terms of small r. Small r is the distance from the origin to the observation point, and a is the radius of the loop, and theta and phi and phi dash. And then uh, we went into the current distribution. So in the current distribution, since we are dealing with, we are having only the A phi component, only the D phi component. Let me put it other way. So since we have only the phi component of the current, we are using the cylindrical coordinate system for the current expression uh, and the unit vectors are the spherical coordinate system. And the current distribution has no rho component and no z component, so it has only a phi component. Uh, sorry, uh, i phi component. And uh, once we have the current distribution, we have a space factor in the current distribution, so we plug into the integral equation and we try to evaluate the integral. So there are three sub components: uh, the a r, a theta, and a phi component. So we first took the a phi component because it is simple to evaluate, and we made an important approximation that we are dealing with small loops. So once we are dealing with small loops, that is when a tends to zero, we can express the f of a function uh, using Maclaurin series. And we retain only the first two terms there, not all the terms, only the first two terms. And we get an expression for f of a when a tends to zero. So then we evaluate the a phi integral. So please evaluate this integral. So this integral, it is much simpler to evaluate this integral. So you get this expression. So in terms of a phi and a r and a theta are zero. You can show that a r and a theta are zero. This is slightly involved, but can be evaluated. So then once we have a auxiliary vector potential, we can calculate the magnetic field uh, intensity and electric field intensity. Uh, magnetic field intensity is given by this expression. And if you plug in the spherical coordinate systems, so you have to evaluate this curl in the spherical coordinate system. And if you plug in the values for expression for a, auxiliary vector potential, you get the magnetic field intensity and you get the electric field intensity also. You, if you look at the expressions, it looks like the, it look it looks like it is a dual of the expressions that we got from the uh, infinitesimal dipole antenna. So you have very much similar components except for the ER, E theta and E phi and HR, H theta and H phi in case of infinitesimal dipole antenna. And then once we have the expressions for the electric and magnetic field intensity, the next step is to evaluate the pointing vector and calculate the power density, average power density. So once we have the average power density, it has both real part and the reactive part. And uh, 
we are interested in only the real component or the imaginary component imaginary component corresponds to the pulsed power which is uh, which is kind of being exchanged between the source and the antenna periodically with time and since we are interested in the real power that is actually being radiated we will take only the real component of the power density and then we evaluated the total power radiated from the antenna in terms of current and we calculated the radiation resistance since we know the total power radiated in terms of current we can calculate the radiation resistance and uh, once we have the power density we can evaluate the radiation intensity means we have the radiation intensity directivity can be calculated very straightforward so it is exactly identical to the infinitesimal dipole antenna what we had and the effective aperture area is also one and the same and this is we summarize the results that we got for the small loop antenna and then we took some examples just to see uh, some interesting feature of the small loop antenna especially if there is multi turn but let me say it once again that great confidence has not been placed in analytical methods for multi multi turn loop antenna so you have to simulate it or you have to do experimental procedures the simulation is a better is a much better way to evaluate the radiation properties so go for simulation if you are dealing with multi turn loop antennas and we came to know that since the loop antenna has the cell strong self inductance we need some matching network right without the matching network we cannot we will not be able to transfer the maximum energy from the source to the antenna so the matching network needed is a capacitance parallel capacitance and we looked how to evaluate the parallel capacitance provided we know the input impedance of the antenna so if you know the input impedance of the antenna what will be the capacitance value to in order to make z in dash is equal to zg so that's the overall idea uh, so we got we came to know we we looked into this aspect and then we just saw the radiation pattern of what happens for finite length now we are moving from small loop antennas to finite loop antennas with constant current so we make a very interesting approximations that we say that it is finite length at the same time we say that it is constant current which is not same which is not right correct because uh, as soon as we make the length finite uh, the constant current approximation is not valid anymore but still we make that approximation just to kind of move from uh, hypothetical antenna to realistic antenna so we saw that the radiation pattern will be much more complicated expression but it has a normal directional pattern and if you take the circumference to be 0.1 lambda if you keep increasing the length of the antenna then your grating lobe starts coming into the picture so there is all there is a limit to the length of the antenna which you can increase assuming that there is a constant current source but realistically there won't be a constant current there will be non uniform current and the non uniform current radiation pattern even for uh, length lambda for circumference equal to dan lambda you see it's much more complicated it is not simple omnidirectional pattern it is much more complicated than omnidirectional pattern so uh, my suggestion is the take away from the previous class is if you are dealing with loop antennas there are very there is only one parameter there are very few parameters let me say, say in other words suppose you are dealing with loop antennas there are look, uh, one is the radius of the loop second thing is the width of the trace or the diameter of the wire itself and the third parameter is the number of turns so there are only three parameters to play with it so hence uh, my suggestion is go for simulation and try to understand what is happening with each of these parameter and try to simulate it and then if the simulation gives you the desired radiation properties print it or fabricate it and then use it in your application so that's uh, that's the take away but uh, try to know how to simulate sorry how to analyze the loop antennas at least small loop antennas just for the sake of uh, academic interest okay so any clarifications required in the previous uh, class we had or is it okay we can move forward so i think it was clear to all of you so please revisit the course in case if you have any clarifications required in the uh, previous class okay so let us take the next topic which is uh, the tutorial for the 
wire antennas. So I have a tutorial for the wire antennas. There is not much. Uh, there is not much of problems that I have compiled. There are only very few problems which I have compiled. So we will uh, look into these problems and then we terminate today's meeting. So OK, let us check the first problem. Uh, lambda by two half wavelength dipole situated with its center at the origin radiates a time average power of 600 watts. So power is given, the total power transmitted is given and it is told that the antenna is a half wavelength dipole. So we know the radiation resistance, we know its radiation pattern and we know all the expressions related to half wavelength dipole at a frequency of 300 megahertz. So lambda is also given. A second half wavelength dipole is placed at its with its origin at a observation point r theta phi where the distance is given theta is 90 degree that means it is in the orthogonal plane since it is in the orthogonal plane with the life it is very much simple and phi is 40 degrees it is oriented so that the axis are in parallel to that of the transmitting antenna what do we mean by this it is oriented so that its axis is parallel to that of the transmitting antenna so the receiving antenna is oriented so that the axis is parallel to that of the transmitting antenna. So what parameter that is, does that uh -huh. signify? Yes, anybody wants to attempt? You know it. I think all of almost all of you know it. You just you can express what does it signify. It has to do with polarization loss factor, right? So the receiving antenna is oriented so that its axis is parallel to that of the transmitting antenna indicates that they are polarization matched. So the polarization loss factor is one. So what is the available power at the terminus of the second or the receiving dipole? So we are supposed to calculate the power at the receiving antenna. So what we have is we have a transmitting antenna and the receiving antenna and the distance is given. Both of them are uh, half wavelength dipole. Frequency is given, so lambda is known. So the first thing is to verify whether we are in the far field region because most of the expressions that we calculated was in the far field region. So we, we go with the thumb rule of 2D square by lambda, evaluate the 2D square by lambda, which is 0.5 meter. And we are in the 200 meters, so we are in the far field region. So 200 meters is much, much larger than the uh, thumb rule for the far field, which is 2D square, the bounty for the far field, which is 2D square per lambda. So we we are in the far field region, so that's not a problem. So we can evaluate, use the expressions which we evaluated for the half open dipole in the far field region. So the next step is to use the free transmission equation. Which which relates in terms of gain and the lambda and the distance. The P received is equal to P received by P transmit, right? So there should be P. Yeah, P received by P transmit. So that should be the ratio. So the P received by P transmit is given by this expression, where the gains have been replaced with di uh, directivity because we are dealing with half wavelength dipole and uh, for lossless antenna, we, we have not evaluated the losses, right? Neither the radiation loss nor the uh, reflection loss. So that the gain is replaced by directivity and we know the directivity of the half wavelength dipole is 1.643. We have seen this, right? It is not 1.5. That is for infinitesimal dipole antenna. 1.643 is for the half wavelength dipole antenna. So plug in the values, you get uh, the power. This is the ratio. This is PR by PT. So in this, this ratio, you have to multiply with the transmitting power, which is 600 watt to get the receive power. Okay, this was more of a freeze. We just have to use uh, the information available from the dipole antenna. Okay, let us take another problem. A half wave dipole antenna is. Am I audible? Uh, uh, can anybody confirm that I am audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yes. yes, sir. Okay, okay. Okay, so let me take the next problem. A half wave dipole, uh, half wavelength dipole antenna is radiating in the free space. Okay. 
and the coordinate system is defined so that the origin is at the center of the dipole. So this is exactly what we have analyzed. And Z axis is aligned with the dipole. So this is what we have analyzed, right? Sometimes the uh, antenna is oriented in the Y axis or X axis. That times the equations what we have calculated, you have to recalculate. You have to redo it. The geometry changes, right? So your theta phi is going to change. So you have to redo it if, if the antenna is oriented in the x axis or in the y axis. Input power to the dipole is 100 watt, assuming an overall efficiency of 50%. So what do you mean by overall efficiency 50%? It's a total efficiency, right? So it includes the reflective losses and the, it includes both reflection efficiency and radiation efficiency. So the total efficiency is 50%. Find the power density at the distance and at theta equal to 60 degree, not theta equal to 90, theta equal to 60 degrees and phi equal to zero. So we are supposed to calculate the power density. So let us see how to evaluate it. So the power density is given by half this expression, right? Half magnitude of E by theta naught in the far field. So in the far field, the power density is given by this expression. So if we know how to express E, the electric field intensity in terms of the pattern we have seen that in terms of current so the power density average power density is given by this expression so in this expression we know what is uh, this is 120 pi we know the distance distance is given which is 500 meters theta is given 60 degrees so we just need to find out the current we don't know what is the current Instead, the power is given. It is told that the 100 watt power is given and the total efficiency is given. So we need to evaluate the current. So we know the P radiated is given by uh, radiation resistance into current and we know the radiation resistance for the half wavelength dipole antenna, which is 73 ohm, close to 73 ohm. And P radiated is 50% of the 100 watt. So that is 50 watts. So 50 watts is being radiated and radiation resistance is known. So we can evaluate the current. Right, so we know the current. So in this expression, plug in the value for the current and you get the uh, power average power density. Okay, so you just plug in the values and you get the average power density. So the, here the goal is to determine the current given the power because we know the radiation resistance of the dipole antenna to be 73 ohm. Okay, so let us take another problem. A linear half wavelength dipole antenna is operating at a frequency of 1 gigahertz. The wavelength is given. Determine the capacitance and inductance, the R inductance that must be placed across or in parallel the input impedance of the dipole so that the antenna becomes resonant at the desired frequency. We, we know that, right? We have seen that even in the simulation and even in the analytical, analytical method of, even in the analysis, we, we know that the half wavelength dipole is not going to resonate, right? So the input impedance is 73 ohm plus 40 J or something around 42 J or something is the input impedance. And in the actual simulation, it is it is deviating even much further. So in that case, what so we are supposed to make it resonate at one gigahertz, which is not which is not resonating at one gigahertz. We are supposed to make it resonate at one gigahertz. One of the method is to trim the antenna. So if you trim the antenna, automatically it resonates at 1 gigahertz. We have to trim it according to the disk length. We have to vary the length until it resonates at 1 gigahertz. Alternatively, you can do impedance matching. You can either replace capacitance or conductance in parallel to the input imp terminals such that the input impedance becomes purely real. What is the VSWR of the resonant? After making it resonant, what is the VSWR of the dipole antenna when it is connected to a 50 ohm transmission line? So the first thing is to calculate the input impedance of the dipole antenna. We know the input impedance, right? So the half wavelength dipole antenna, this is the input impedance. Now, since we are we are supposed to connect it in parallel, uh, we are supposed to connect either a capacitance or an inductance in parallel. We are supposed to calculate the admittance, input admittance. So the input admittance is one by Z in, which is and you take the conjugate uh, complex conjugate and then you evaluate that, take the one by Z in. So you get the input admittance. Okay, so input admittance is given. So input admittance is negative in the sense. What does it mean? Is it inductive? Is it capacitive? What is it? What does it imply? Input admittance is negative. Susceptance is negative.
inductance inductive right so it is inductive so inductance is dominant so since the input ad admittance is inductive we are supposed to place a parallel capacitance uh, we are to we are supposed to place a capacitance parallel to the input field so what should be that capacitance so the capacitance has to cancel the susceptance so omega c in should be equal to b in right so it has to cancel the capacitance so it has to have to cancel the susceptance so the capacitance is given by omega c in so the susceptance of the capacitor is given by omega c in should be equal to b in so frequency is known b in we evaluated it so determine the capacitance so the capacitance is around 1 picofarad so that much of capacitance you have to place it at the uh, feed of the dipole so this is the dipole so this is the dipole so at the feed you have to place the capacitance okay next we have to determine the vswr when when after matching right so what happens is if you place a capacitance the susceptance is gone so the uh, remaining component is the conductance so the conductance is given by this expression so take the inverse of the conductance we get the resistance so the resistance is 97 ohm so it was 73 became 97 ohm so the reflection coefficient is z all z l minus z not by z l plus z not so plug in z l is equal to 97 ohm with respect to 50 ohm system we get the uh, vswr so vswr is around 1.9 or something approximately so can anybody tell me which is a better approach trimming the antenna or we have trimmed the antenna in the simulation and we have now tried to match it so using just a single component of capacitance so vswr is around 1.9 which is the better approach which one would you follow if you are engineer and if somebody asks you to design a dipole antenna matching or trimming the antenna anybody wants to try Yes. Sir, matching. Matching. Why? Sir, because I think for trimming the antenna, some special tools and special laboratory type of environment will be required, which is more study. Okay, that's a good uh, uh, answer in the sense, suppose the antenna is very specialized and uh, most probably you need some trimming tools or uh, a specialized laboratory equipment to trim the antenna. I agree with that. Suppose let me reframe the question. Suppose you are designing a PCB antenna, PCB dipole antenna. In that case, it is required to make an uh, inexpensive and easy to fabricate uh, antenna, then trimming will be beneficial. So, if you go for inexpensive uh, solution, so if you're designing uh, because your matching network is going to add cost right so the more the components there is it adds cost to the system so trimming is going to help if you are uh, doing if you are operating at a low cost product if you're working on a low cost product i agree with that also that's a very interesting discussion so but let me say that you see the vswr and see the input impedance that we are getting so if you remember when we were simulating, we were getting a return loss of something like 15 dB or 16 dB, right? I don't exactly remember, but approximately like something like 15 dB. So the input impedance was around 40 ohms or at resonance frequency after resonance, after trimming the antenna. So we were getting uh, matching VSWR of 1.2 or 1.3, something like that. Whereas VSWR with single component matching is 1.9. So you need one more matching network to transform this 19 ohms to 50 ohms, correct? So can anybody tell me what is the other matching network that may be required? What is the other simplest matching network you are aware of to transform this 97 ohm, close to 100 ohm to 50 ohm? Quarter wavelength. 
quarter we can transform it, right? So because we are matching from real to real impedance, so we can transform this 100 ohm to close to 50 ohm with a quarter wave transformer. So the matching network needed is, let me try to point. So this is a dipole antenna. So we have a capacitance parallel connected here. And then we need a quarter wave length transformer. Correct? So this is 90 degrees. And uh, this will be the, you know, the how to calculate the uh, characteristic impedance of the quarter wave transformer, square root of 100 into 50, right? So that will be the characteristic impedance of the transformer. So this is the matching network required. So you can you can remember this problem so that in field, if if you want to design matching network, you know what exactly you need. You need a capacitance and you need a quarter wave length transformer to match the, suppose as, uh, uh, one of you are telling uh, that if the antenna is fixed, for some reason you cannot trim the antenna. It is fixed and you cannot trim it. It's fixed. So in such case, the matching network required is capacitance and the quarter wave transformer. Okay, so let us check other problem. Probably this is the last problem. So a satellite, yes, transmits an electromagnetic wave at 10 gigahertz. So wavelength is given. Why it's transmitting antenna? The characteristics of the satellite based transmitters are given as follows. So, the power radiated from the satellite is 10 watt, frequency is given, power is given, distance from the satellite to uh, the earth station is this much, it is given in terms of meters. The transmitting antenna has a directivity of 50 dB, so huge. So, the transmitting antenna is given. Ignore the ground effects. Determine the magnitude of the electric field at A, at the receiver. If a receiver at point A is a lambda by 2 dipole antenna, what would be the voltage reading at the terminals of the antenna? So there are two subparts into the problem. So first, let us evaluate the magnitude of the electric field at the receiving. So it's very straightforward. Second thing is, suppose if the dipole antenna is placed at the receiver, receiving point, what will be the voltage reading of the terminals of the, of the antenna? Okay, so let us try to see how to go about this problem. So radiated power is given, distance is given, directivity of the transporting antenna is given. So directivity is nothing but, so the first thing is we want to calculate the electric field intensity, right? So to calculate the electric field intensity, uh, the first thing is we, we evaluate the radiation intensity. So we know the power, power radiated and the directivity. So calculate U maximum. U maximum is obtained. Once you know your maximum and distance R, we can calculate the power density. Power density is nothing but E by 2 eta, right? So you know your maximum, so you know distance R, so you can calculate the power density. Once you know the power density, which is nothing but magnitude of E square by 2 eta, eta we know, which is 120 pi, so we can calculate the magnetic field. So it's very straightforward. So, you know, directivity and power related calculate U maximum. Once you know U maximum, calculate power density. Once you know power density, calculate E. So, that's how we move forward. So, this is the electric field intensity at the receiving point. Now, an antenna is placed, dipole antenna is placed at the receiver. So, what is the total voltage across the terminals of the antenna? It's the second subpart to it. So, using the freeze formula, what we are supposed to know is we have to, so, calculate the total power received. So the total power received to the total power transmitted is given by the Fritz formula, right? And since it is glasses antenna, we use 100% efficiency, no polarization mismatch, and no uh, deflection losses. Everything is assumed to be 100% efficient. So in that case, we, have we can replace it with directivity. So once we replace it with directivity, distance is known, distance is known, frequency is given, transmit power is given, we know the received power. So uh, the received power under the complex conjugate match, means under the conjugate matching, we have the received power is given by related to voltage, voltage by 8 R in. R in is the radiation resistance of the dipole antenna. So the dipole antenna is conjugately matched to, there is a conjugate matching from the dipole antenna to the receiver. So that is assumed here. So in that case, we, uh, we know the P received power from the free transmission equation. And R in we know from the dipole antenna. So R in is 73 ohm. 
so you get a conjugate matching and in that case the voltage across the terminals of the antenna is given by some if you plug the values it is around 2 micro volt so it was something to do with the dipole antenna so i included here okay so with that i think we have come to the end of today's session so thank you everyone let me just stop the recording and then we'll phone we can have the discussion